that are old. <laughs> the miracle here is having glasses and readers that you can read these things with. <laughs> you young people don't know this yet. So, <clears throat> Matthew nine fourteen through 38. Then the disciples of John came to him asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. While he was saying these things to them, a synagogue official came and bowed down before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and began to follow him, and so did his disciples. And a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will get well. But Jesus turned and, seeing her, said, Daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. At once the woman was made well. When Jesus came into the official's house, he saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder. He said, Leave, for the girl has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. But when the crowd had been sent out, he entered and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. The news spread throughout all the land. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him throughout all the land. As they were going out, a mute, demon-possessed man was brought to him. After the demon was cast out, the mute, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed and were saying, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. Jesus, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion on them, because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Thank God for glass. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. I appreciate that. Well, like I said, we are going again, we're starting back up in the book of Matthew, um, and we're starting in this passage right now where Jesus it is actually depicted in some ways as a very divisive person, and he has evoked strong reactions in this passage as he has preached the coming of the kingdom and healed people of various diseases. Uh, but it was his own teaching and self-understanding that continues uh, the division even to this day as we look at this passage in Matthew chapter 9. So today I want us to look at three things. 
the contrasts that are presented in this passage and Jesus' assessment of them, and then finally, Jesus' divisiveness. Jesus is a man of very stark contrasts. He has stark remarks, he says, and he has very stark actions that he does. And nowhere is this taught more forcefully than in this little passage in just verses 14 to 17 of chapter 9, when he speaks about the joy of his new age. Because the disciples of John the Baptist, they didn't understand Jesus. They noticed that Jesus did not in, encourage or teach fasting like their teacher John did or like the Pharisees did. And John had preached the coming of the kingdom and called the nation to prepare by, by repentance and then therefore, obviously, fasting because fasting goes along with repentance. And fasting is an interesting thing in scripture. And some people can get very caught up in the idea of fasting because fasting is really, it's an expression of depression. And it's being sad and it's so downcast and you're so moved that you really have no interest in eating. But when we celebrate, how do we typically, we celebrate? We celebrate by eating, by feasting. And we cook up a large amount of food and we have a big potluck. Um, and the kind of food that we cook up isn't necessarily the healthiest food, but it's enjoyable food. It's a time of celebration. When we're not celebrating, when it's the exact opposite of celebration, when we're mourning, that's when we don't eat. We can't eat if we're heartbroken. And John came preaching the message of repentance, which, which it came with fasting. And the Pharisees, they had all kinds of rules and regulations about fasting, all bits and pieces um, of the law that they would assemble together, such as when you fast or how you fast or how much you fast or what you fast from. And Jesus didn't seem to fast much, nor did he really teach his disciples to fast as a ritual or a practice. Although he did in preparation for his temptation or if there was a specific demon that to be cast out, which required prayer and fasting. Jesus' responses, though, highlight the difference between himself and John and the contrast between himself and the Pharisees. You see, he was not like John, even though they preached the same message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Because Jesus brought the kingdom of heaven with him. He was the bridegroom at the wedding. John may have been the best man, but he was never the bridegroom. And John may have encouraged the people to wait till the party starts, but Jesus was the reason for the party. And his arrival, his, Jesus' arrival is no time to mourn or to fast. Jesus is the time his arrival is a time to rejoice. It's a time to celebrate, to feast. And when he leaves, well, that'll be the time to fast when he's taken away, as he describes it in this passage, a hint of what is going to be happening to him in his crucifixion and his death. That would be a time to fast. But as long as he is with us, it's a time for feasting. In the, in the meantime, he's while he's here, He's now, re it's a time to rejoice. Well, of course, now we live after the death and after the resurrection of Christ. So is this a time for fasting or is this a time for feasting? Well, if you believe in the resurrection, this is a time for feasting. <clears throat> for Jesus said, for I am with you even to the end of the age. So victory has been won with the death and resurrection of Christ. And Christianity really is a great religion of joy. The one great emotion that scripture keeps teaching us is joy. And Paul said it to the Philippians. What did he say? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And we're people. We're, we're wired to be joyful people. I mean, we even see this in the world. They want joy. Um, 
We're people of song and joy because we're people of salvation. We're people of forgiveness and mercy and pardon. We're people of new life and regeneration. Christianity should be a joyful, not a sad religion. There are moments, though, where we have to be sad. There are moments when we face the death and when we face the death of our loved ones, of our friends and, and a spouse. And these truly are really sad times. There are moments when we're saddened even by our own sinfulness or someone else's sinfulness. But in general, we are the people who live steadfast in the hope of the resurrection of ourselves through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't grieve as other people grieve who have no hope. We are the people of joy, for our bridegroom is with us always. Jesus was also not like the Pharisees. He couldn't be fit into their form of Judaism. It would be like trying to attach a new cloth to an old outfit or putting new wine into old wineskins. Or in the modern vernacular, you're painting a car that's headed for the junkyard. Um, there's no way you could accommodate him inside the old ways. He, he came to live in such a way that the old ways would be totally destroyed, the old methods. The contrast really here, it's just too great. So what Jesus came to do was not what they were doing. The two views are really incompatible. So here again is a little warning of the division that Jesus was provoking them a division that can be seen even in our world today. And then you come to this series of healing events. First, you have the, the raising of the, of the girl and then the healing of the woman with the flow of blood and the healing of two blind men and the exercising of the man who couldn't speak. And it's summarized in verse 35 in our passage that we're looking at. It says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Each of these recorded uh, healings has its own particular emphasis in that we will look at in this passage. The cleansing power of Jesus was able to touch the legally unclean. But instead of being con Jesus being contaminated and defiled by what he touched, we see the exact opposite happen. The, what he touched was purified and cleansed. <clears throat> the bleeding woman, the dead girl, the Pharisees would never touch the dead. Uh, that would defile them. The Pharisees would never touch the body of, of a dead person. Um, or, or someone who was bleeding. Again, they'd be defiled. The blind men who couldn't see, they could still see more clearly, though, than the Pharisees as to who Jesus was. The mute man whose exorcism led him to speak and whose healing brought such astonishment to the crowds. And it says that there was never anything like this in Israel. But each of these healings have certain things in common. And each of them is addressing the spiritually disabling effect of illness. You see, these people are not just physically ill. They are spiritually and even ritually unclean because they are un un unable to enter the temple. None of them are. This poor woman would never be accepted into her community or back into her family, always living under the suggestion that she was being condemned by God. Yet Jesus brings salvation to her as he brings salvation to each of these people. And the healings are by the power of his word, even more so than his touch. So the woman touches and she is healed. But Jesus prevents the whole idea of superstition, of just touching something, emphasizing that it is her belief in him. It's the woman's faith in verse 21. It's the blind man's faith in verse 29. And it shows that Jesus has power over the forces of evil and the forces of death that are at work in the world even today. But it's the responses that I want to draw your attention to today 
for not only is it the primary response that Jesus is calling for or looking for and expecting, there are other responses revealed and they drive the events forward to the cross. Um, there's a very natural response to the spreading of the news. There, there could be no way that a resurrection would happen without news spreading far and wide, right? Um, I mean, this little girl was dead. They were there. They had seen her. They laughed at Jesus when he, when he brought the idea that he could bring her back to life. And they were getting ready for a funeral. And we read in verse 26 that after Jesus healed, the little girl raised, the little girl raised up, and the report of this went through all the district. I bet it did, and I bet it went a lot further as well. And who wouldn't be talking about this, really? Let's think about that. This would be spread far and wide. But interestingly enough, this doesn't prove that Jesus is God, that he is deity. We shouldn't jump too quickly to say, well, that proves who he is. I mean, if we look back in the Old Testament at Elijah and Elisha, they saw experiences these of resurrections from the dead, if you remember. But they didn't prove that they were God. Uh, mind you, the prophets Elijah, like, like Elijah and Elisha, they don't turn up every day. In fact, they lived 700 to eight, 750 to 800 years or so. They lived in the 8th century BC before Jesus even did any of this. We read, sometimes when we read our Bibles, we lose that historical time perspective because we see this on one page and then a, a, just a few pages or a book or two later, then we see Jesus coming on the scene. Um, there's only a few pages between them. And we forget that there's 800 years separating them. There were resurrections in the Bible, but they are few and far that are between Elijah and Elisha and Jesus. But it was extraordinary when it did happen and the news would spread and everyone was talking about this. And there's no way that you could stop these two blind men from telling their story far and wide. Jesus warned them very strongly not to talk. They, they couldn't shut up. Uh, could you? Would you even do that? I mean, obviously, I couldn't. I, I blabber too much. There's no way. Um, there's no way that a talkative person like myself would possibly have held in that information that, that I was blind, and now I can see. And so they spread his fame through the whole district, as we read in verse 31. But they went out and spread his fame throughout all the district. Furthermore, Jesus didn't stop from doing miracles. It it wasn't as if he raised a little girl, he healed two blind men, and then, then he retired. No, Jesus kept on. He kept on doing his commission, his work, wherever he went. He was teaching. He was preaching about the coming of the kingdom of God. He was healing. He was exercising. But it was in the response to Jesus' miracles that we see the greatest contrast. And we see this in verse 33 and 34 that we're reading today. After the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed, and they were saying, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. And the crowd's acclamation knows no bounds. Nothing like this they've ever seen in Israel. He gives sight to the blind. He gives speech to the mute. He casts out demons. He raises the dead. They've never seen anything like this before. This is something new in Israel. This is just so new. It's not going to fit in the old wineskins of Israel. And this is far beyond anything. Even in our lifetime, God in human flesh performing miracles, upending the whole old system. I mean, if you think that our election was something amazing, think again. Here is the Messiah on the scene. He's upending their whole system, their whole life. They're saying, we're going to have to reevaluate everything that is happening. This is so marvelous. This is not a time for fasting. 
Salvation has arrived, and it's arrived in the land. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is the day that the Lord has made. And the Pharisees' condemnation couldn't be more, more damning. He casts out demons by the prince of demons. I'm sure there's no doubt that he's doing these miracles, but what's the source of his power? I mean, they have seen these happen, but they're questioning, okay, where is the source of his power? Couldn't be God. It, it's not God. It's, it's the evil one. He himself must be demonic. You can't actually move farther apart, really, than these two views. Either it's God or it's demons. Um, this was the Pharisees' view of Jesus because Jesus really didn't give them a middle ground to land on in this whole scene here. There's no middle ground. He is of God or he is not of God. And, and, and if that's the case, then what are we seeing here? We know it's not natural. We know that it's supernatural. If it's not God, what other supernatural force do you have available to you? If it is God, then we should follow him. That's what the Pharisees should have done. If it is not God, then we're not going to follow him. Basically, he's destroying the whole legal pharisaical system and there's no way that they're going to give up pharisaism and follow him and if he and so if he's wrong and it's supernatural there's only one option left on the scene there isn't there <clears throat> it's demonic it's the demons it's the prince of the demons that he's doing this by and in contrast of opinion about him we have jesus's assessment his own judgment of what is happening, his own assessment of what it all means, his own self-awareness of, of the meanings of these actions. For we read that Jesus, he looks on the crowds and what? He has compassion. He had compassion. He saw the struggle of their lives under the tyranny of Rome, under the tyranny of evil, under sickness, under death, and under the judgment of God. It's also the fact that they've placed their trust in the religious system of the day. And right before their eyes, Jesus is demolishing it. You might even be able to understand that even the people, when we read that, that they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Because their system is being demolished right in front of their eyes. Their spiritual leadership is crumbling before their eyes. They're distressed and they're dispirited. But for us, this is great news, great news that's so great that so often we're myopic that we take it for granted. It's great news that our Lord and Savior, like this Father in heaven who is full of compassion and kindness, and we live in a world, right, that is full of pain and, and sickness and difficulty and sorrow and suffering, and frankly, death is really never far away from any of us, is it? And for a lot of people right now, their world in our culture has been demolished and smashed and they are distressed and they are dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And it's important to be reminded that God knows this and that his loving compassion is not unmoved by our plight. And rather, it's just the opposite. Because of our plight, he sent his one and only son into the world to destroy the works of the devil. He cares and he loves and he sees our problem and he is acting to solve it. But, but Jesus' assessment of the nation of Israel was more specific than that and more prophetic. For he saw in Israel, he saw them as harassed, as helpless, scattered sheep without a shepherd. Now, that's also standard Old Testament language for Israel, for the judgment of God was always to scatter the people. And the salvation of God is to gather the people. I want to repeat that because I think that's an interesting thing to think about. The judgment of God was always to scatter the people. And then the salvation of God is to gather the people. It, this goes back to the Tower of Babel when God scattered the nations. And it runs all the way through the Old Testament. The judgment of God is to scatter people, and so Israel was scattered into the exile of Babylon. 
and they were dispersed. And to me, often you hear that word, the diaspora. In fact, the dispersion is a way of talking about Israel under judgment. Just as the salvation of God was always to gather the people of God back together, to make them one tribe, one nation, one people, all gathered together under one king. That's salvation indeed. That's the meaning of the word church. The word church, ecclesia, means gathering, a gathering of God's people. We, we are God's people. We are God's people restored, gathered together. We who are saved are gathered together by God it's because this is his gathering. But it's not just a standard cliche. This, goes, this is an allusion back to Ezekiel chapter 34, part of which we read earlier this morning. There the people of Judah had been scattered. They were scattered by the Babylonians on this occasion. Um, scattered as part of the judgment of God on their wickedness. Scattered because the shepherds were not good shepherds. They didn't care for the sheep. They were selfish shepherds, caring only for themselves, lining their own pockets and making themselves wealthy. Enjoying the fruit, but not doing really any of the work. They didn't care for the lost sheep of Israel. They didn't care for the ones who weren't lost. They didn't even care for the ones who weren't lost, who were just are still around. They were fattening the sheep up for the kill. It was really what they were doing. So the people of God had nobody to defend them, to lead them to better pastures. They were all vulnerable to the, the wild dog, the lion, the wolf, or even the Babylonian that came by. So God promised, and he promises in Ezekiel 34, and it's a wonderful chapter. Read it sometime this coming week. And it's the basis behind John chapter 10, the good shepherd passage. Um, God promised that he would come and shepherd his sheep himself. He would establish his kingdom, and he would appoint one shepherd over all his people, his own son, the son of David. And no longer would the sheep be left leaderless. His son would lead us. No longer would we be scattered. No longer would we fight amongst ourselves because there would be a shepherd who would govern us and rule us and care for us. And, and Jesus knew that he was to be the shepherd. Jesus knew that, the, go, the good shepherd who would lay down his life for the sheep. And then he moves to a different illustration. He moves to the illustration of farming and that of a plentiful harvest. And again, there's this image of contrast that we see here. For, for the harvest, again, it's the language of judgment. It's the time for separating the wheat from the chaff. It's time to rejoice in the crops and to burn the useless. It's time when justice will come and vindication will arrive and some will be saved and some will be damned. But Jesus' assessment doesn't focus on the damnation element. Even though the judgment on God on false shepherds is there in Ezekiel 34, Jesus' assessment focuses on the plentiful nature of the harvest. Let's read this passage. You see, we can look out at the, at the harvest or the judgment and say, we're going to have a big bonfire. <laughs> we can do that. I mean, or we could look at the harvest and say, we're going to have a bumper crop. That's two ways of looking at the judgment. It's, there's a certain kind of negativity that looks at the harvest and ignores the crop for the sake of the bonfire of the chaff that's coming. And yet, that's how the Pharisees looked at it. They look at the crop and they say, Gee, there's a lot of tares out there. There's a lot of chaff out there. We're really going to have to do a lot of, whereas Jesus, he was looking at the crop and saying, look at the wheat ready for harvest. Look at the ears. They're full for harvest. All is not lost. There are many that could be won into his kingdom. And it just requires the work of many laborers to secure the plentiful harvest. And so he prays in verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them 
because they were harassed and, and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest, which is the introductory verse for what happens immediately in chapter 10 when he calls the disciples and sends them out into the harvest. And this is a passage that emphasizes the healing, the saving work of the coming of the Messiah and the coming of the kingdom of God and the compassion of Jesus upon the people who are so scattered and they're vulnerable. It's actually one of the great motivations for evangelism. Sure, we can look at our society around us and say, that, see that judgment is still here by the sinful way in which we're living and the judgment that we do see take place. And that judgment is necessary for justice to ever be done in this land, but we can also see people as confused and bewildered. And we can see it in the reaction even to this last election. We can see thousands of confused and lost and unhappy people. They're, they're sinning against themselves and, and each other and being sinned against. And surely the elites in our society right now, they're more given to lining their own pockets and caring for the needs of other people than their own needs than for the needs of other people, just acquiring more things and more land and more money and more power, and while ignoring the needs of the people who are in desperate need for people just wanting to eke out a living. And we can even still see that, I mean, with what's taking place. But Jesus... He didn't look at this in judgment. Jesus looked with compassion, not with hostility, but he looked with love. And he saw this at this moment in time before the dreadful day came. There was still opportunity. There's still opportunity to save some. And there's still opportunity to bring people in. And so he asked his disciples to pray for the laborers that a plentiful harvest might be brought in before it was too late. So we see when the disciples were sent out, it was in the context of this contrast that we've been reading about, the world's assessment, especially the Pharisees, and Jesus' assessment of what is happening and what is taking place. John the Baptist's disciples, they didn't understand what was happening. Only Jesus understood what was happening. And his assessment of this whole situation put him in stark contrast to everyone else around him, the disciples of John and the Pharisees. And this assessment really, it, it's in stark contrast, but this assessment is also a moment of salvation as we await the inevitable judgment. And so with the judgment, we see Jesus bringing division the kind of division that he still brings to this very day. For Jesus is really, he's not somebody who's easily tolerated in his day or even in our day, and we, we can see that. Um, his claims about himself are just too great, and his claims over our lives are, is just too great to simply ignore him as just some sim gentle healer of the, of the first century, Jesus, meek and, and mild, it doesn't actually fit. He's not just bringing salvation, he's bringing it under the threat of coming judgment. He's not just bringing a, a, a teaching or, or a philosophy, he's bringing a whole new way of understanding. He's not just seeking the lost, he's sending out others to multiply his work and to bring in as many as possible. He's not just Im improving the lot of people, fixing up this problem and fixing that problem. He's bringing in a whole new age and one that the world, old world, would never fit into, the old system. If Jesus came just to solve the problem of a mute man and a couple of blind people and, and a little girl who died and a woman with a flow of blood, he didn't do much. Let's be honest. I mean, you can go to a, a hospital today and we can see healings and, and many more than that are happening daily in our world. 
it, it, if that's what Jesus came to do, it wasn't much, but that's not it. Those are but a symbol. They are, those are but the tip of the iceberg of what is happening. What is happening? The kingdom of God is arriving on earth. That's what's taking place. The kingdom of God is arriving on earth, and these are signs of what's taking place. A whole new world, a whole new kingdom has come. And so he's bringing the end to the religious leaders of the past day. The godly John the Baptist and the ungodly Pharisees, they're both coming to an end. The godly John the Baptist who called to repentance and moved crowds to fasting and sackcloth and ashes, that's even coming to an end. And the ungodly Pharisees who the teaching of the law bound people up into terrible legal knots and rules and regulations, that's even coming to an end. And all those things are gone with the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Even if Jesus' message started out with repentance, like John's, it followed with salvation, with forgiveness and pardon and mercy. For, for he was the bridegroom who brought the party of salvation. Because every time we come to church, we, we confess our sins, right? Um, but the big thing is not that we come and confess our sins. The big thing is that we come and we confess our sins and forgiveness has been declared to us. That is the beautiful part. And we can stand up and we can say, hallelujah, we're saved, we're rescued. Even though I'm a sinful wretch, I'm pardoned, I am forgiven, I am washed clean. And Jesus claims they're, they're outlandish, they're even blasphemous if they're not true. And, and here is the division that Jesus calls. If his, if his claims are true, then all other religions are false, right? I mean, even the best of them in Judaism is inadequate. The atheists must be wrong, but so are the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Muslims and the Jews. They're all wrong. And they're worse than wrong. Because if Jesus' claims are true, then these are the lies of Satan. That's pretty politically incorrect to say, isn't it? Um, I, I, because basically I've just wiped out half of the world's population or more into saying that they are under the deception of Satan. If Jesus' claims are true, and what I've said is true, he is profoundly divisive. If Jesus' claims are untrue, then we are Christians are to be most pitied, wrote the Apostle Paul. For if we believe a lie, we misrepresent God, and we're still in our sins and facing judgment. I just wiped out half of the other population, because Christianity is still one of the largest religions. And if it's not true, then millions of people are, are living under the deception of the devil. So the claims of Jesus, both implicit and explicit, mark him out as a blasphemer for he takes on the role of God or a lunatic because he thought he was God or a fraudster because he was deceiving people into thinking that God was with him when he wasn't. Or indeed, he was the Christ sent by the Father in heaven to destroy the works of the devil and to save you and me. Let's pray.